want to turn now to my colleague, uh, Senior Resident Fellow at the DFR Lab and Managing Editor, Andy Carvin. Andy, over to you. Thanks, Emerson. So my name is Andy Carvin, and I'm Senior Fellow, Managing Editor at the DFR Lab. If one were to somehow be able to set aside the pandemic and the manifest ways it's changed the world, the last year has been nothing short of historic, particularly in terms of people protesting for their rights. From, from Minneapolis to Minsk, from Columbia to Kenosha, people have exercised their rights of free speech and free assembly to demand racial and political justice. As has been the case for much of the last decade, protesters have used social media to organize and amplify their messages. But we've also seen an increase in countervailing forces using these very tools to undermine protesters' messages, to organize, and even to fight back in the streets. The DFR Lab's team of researchers across five continents have been following these events with keen interest. And while there's no way we could summarize every po protest that's taken place everywhere over the last year, we'd like to offer you these three case studies. From Cape Town, South Africa, Jean Leroux will discuss the NSARS protests in Nigeria. From Riga, Latvia, we'll hear from Nika Alekseeva about her work monitoring the Belarus protests. And finally, from Colombia, Esteban Ponce de Leon will explore the narratives and counter narratives used in the ongoing tax protests there. In Nigeria, in the events of, of October 2020 triggered one of the largest social media activism campaigns of the year. The reverberations of this end SARS movement can be felt even today. Uh, a video widely circulated on October 2nd depicted a young man from the town of Ugeli that was allegedly killed by Nigeria's Special Anti-Robbery Squad, or SARS. SARS has for years been at the center of claims of arbitrary police brutality and excessive violence against civilians. Despite it later coming to light that the young man was in fact alive and well, throughout October 2020, the video prompted an outpour of brutal recollections from other Nigerian Twitter users. Under the NSARS hashtag, nationwide protests were organized calling for the disbandment of SARS. One of these protests was held here in Lagos. Thousands of Nigerian youths staged a peaceful sit-in at the Leki Toll Plaza, forming a human blockade that cut off access to several of the city's uh, major business districts for several days. In addition to the on-the-ground protests, the NSARS movement had a massive footprint on social media, where their digital activism dwarfed mentions of other notable events from earlier the month, including the Beirut Warehouse Blast. Video footage and photographs shared by activists on October the 20th, after several days of peaceful demonstrations, showed protesters seated on the freeway, singing along to music, chanting their defiance of a citywide curfew imposed by the Labour state governor. But not all of these protests would eventually leave unharmed. A few hours after the photos were taken, video footage posted on social media showed a convoy of armed vehicles departing a nearby military base known as Bonnie Camp. Buildings and terrain features, including a distinctive markings on the hotel in the background, confirmed the location. At least two vehicles were seen leaving the base at the time. These vehicles made their way along the six kilometer stretch of highway towards the Lekki Tollgate. Videos taken in the vicinity of Lekki Plaza showed similar military vehicles approaching from the west. Automatic weapon fire can be heard being fired in the background as protesters scurry to safety. This is, this is what we see in Nigeria. See what they're causing. See. They are releasing fire. This will, this will, this they are releasing this will, this will, this will. fire. Releasing fire. This is like it all gates. This is like it all gates. Nigerian government, they are shooting no. 
They are shooting at us. They are shooting. Live from the answers, they are shooting. But now we are ready. They have to kill all of us. They are shooting, oh. In one of these videos, Nigerian armed forces can be clearly seen opening fire near the NSAS protesters in front of the Legital Plaza. Social media, and Twitter in particular, provided a crucial account of the events as they unfolded. Timestamps from social media posts provided a rough chronology of the events, and the departure of the armed convoy, the reports of the first shots a short while later, and various terrain features that could be geolocated from these images helped to identify the Nigerian military as they approached from both sides of the Leki Tollgate. Tellingly, these videos also placed the Nigerian military personnel some of whom were discharging their weapons in the vicinity of injured protesters. But far from taking responsibility for their actions, the Nigerian military dismissed initial reports of the shooting as fake news and only grudgingly conceded in a series of cascading denials. First, denying that the military was deployed at all, then denying discharging their weapons and later denying that they used light ammunition. Even the latter was eventually conceded. Social media posts played a crucial part in keeping the Nigerian military accountable for what actually transpired. It would appear that Twitter's role in mobilizing the NSARS protests did not go unnoticed by Nigerian authorities. By October 30, slightly more than a week after the Leki Tollgate shooting, a loosely coordinated cluster of accounts began targeting NGOs and NSARS activists. Meme-like graphics were distributed in a coordinated manner in what appeared to be aimed at undermining the credibility of activists and civil society organizations. What really happened at Leckie Tollgate and five questions Leckie activists must answer circulated among these accounts. At the same time, these accounts posted similarly themed graphics lauding the efforts of the Nigerian military and the incumbent government. These accounts also attempted to suppress further participation in the NSARS protests amongst the youth. The promotion of hashtags such as One Nigeria and Let Love Lead, campaigns meant to persuade the young generation of Nigerian protesters to abandon the protests, were counterweighted with narratives suggesting participation in the protests would be a detriment to their own professional futures. These narratives were distributed through a two-pronged network large follower influencer accounts, some with backgrounds as government spin doctors or digital marketers, aggressively amplified and shared these narratives. In addition, these accounts were supported by a secondary network of batch-created sock puppet accounts that retweeted their posts, giving the, both the suppressive and dismissive narratives the veneer of grassroots support. The Nigerian example shows how social media can be a powerful tool for citizens to mobilize and exercise their democratic rights. At the same time, it provides governments with the means to suppress and undermine those very principles. The double-edged sword of social media provides both an opportunity and a threat to democracies globally. Protests in Belarus started in August 2020, when people went on street because they were dissatisfied with election results. The uncontested leader, Alexander Lukashenko, who is in power for 26 years, won with 80% of alleged public support. It was very unlikely because before the elections, there were at least three candidates who made fierce competition. It was Viktor Babarika, the head of Gazprom Bank in Belarus, Valerij Tsipkalo, the initiator of Belarus startup policy, and Sergei Tikhanovsky, a blogger who advocated for Belarus as a country for living versus just existing and called Lukashenko a cockroach. Lukashenko found ways to put Babarika and Tikhanovsky in jail. Tsipkalo didn't garner enough votes, so later, being afraid of prosecutions, he fled the country. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya decided to run for his husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, and Valeria Tsipkalo, the wife of 
uh, Valery Tsipkalo and Maria Kolesnikova, the head of Babarika's election campaign, joined her. Tikhanovskaya garnered enough signatures to become the candidate. She uh, made rallies, enjoyed people's support, and many crowds went there to support the Democratic candidate for the Belarus elections. On the election day, people went uh, on elections and stood in lines. There was very high turnaround. But when election results came, people learned that Tikhanovskaya garnered less than 20% of votes. So they went on streets protesting against election results and faced riot police. Many people were detained and later there were reports that people in the detention centers were beaten, humiliated, and even tortured. Belarus hasn't anticipated such harsh crackdown of protesters. And after the shock, people decided not to keep silent. They went on streets and gathered in unprecedentedly high numbers. People used uh, the old historical flag of Belarus. They celebrated the female power, sang songs, and used white flowers as the symbol of nonviolent resistance to violent regime. Everyone thought that Lukashenko will resign especially after factory workers who usually support him in elections shouted, go away. But Lukashenko remained. People went on streets, but riot police were detaining people with disabilities, female, elderly, and even bet some women in their face. Independent media was reporting on that. And for that, journalists were also prosecuted and put in jail. But it wasn't just physical violence. It was all also information campaigns, propaganda. And Lukashenko set up not only state-owned TV channels, to discredit protesters, discredit opposition and independent media, but also telegram channels. And here is an example of provocation to discredit independent media outlet to Dubai. You can see two videos. In the first video, you see police detaining a cyclist. Later in Pro Lukashenko telegram channel, another, another video appeared showing a meme. And so allegedly 20 seconds before, the same cyclist was just riding his bike and fell by himself. It shows that cyclist allegedly did, wasn't detained and police helped him to stand up. The first question, was it the same event? And passers-by, the elderly man in the blue frame and the young man in the green frame that we can see in both images, in both video frames, are the same. So we conclude that event is the same. But why someone would film a cyclist from the other side of the street if it wasn't for depicting how he is allegedly falling by himself? to later send the second part of the footage with police taking him away uh, and later showing that this is not what happened. And unfortunately, independent media sometimes fell for such traps and reported misinformation, but we can't uh, evaluate it as deliberate disinformation. So overall, we see that Belarus protests are characterized not only by physical violence, but also information campaigns and harsh crackdown on independent media. The protests in Colombia, also known as the National Strike, start on April 28, 2021, in different cities across the country, initially in protests against a government tax reform proposal. As the protests continue, 
they have transformed into a larger movement against police brutality. At least 50 people, including two police officers, have been killed amidst the national strike. More than 2,000 police violent cases against protesters have been reported, including physical violence, arbitrary arrest, violent interventions, and sexual assault. The DFR lab monitored the conversations on social media around the Colombian protest, including narratives on police violence and posts framing the protest as acts of vandalism. On one hand, the social media narratives on police brutality mostly include videos and pictures showing violence committed by the police and the anti-disturbance squad against protesters. These narratives were mainly accompanied by SOS-related attacks, including SOS Colombia Human Rights, Colombia on Red Alert, Colombia Resist, and they are killing us, referring to the police, and more specifically, to target the government's measures and strategies during the protest. On the other hand, the narratives around acts of vandalism during the protest have also emerged on social media. Some of these narratives originate after political leaders and Twitter accounts linked to the Colombian Centro Democratico Political Party share content of protesters damaging public and private infrastructure. By framing the protests as acts of violence and vandalism, these politicians push for the deployment of military forces to contain the protest. Along with this content, social media accounts use hashtags such as pure and simple vandalism, killer vandals, I support the anti-disturbance squad, and a state of emergency now. Although these hashtags aim to highlight and target acts of vandalism during the protests, those did not negatively influence the perception of the Colombian national strike on social media. The reason? Multiple Twitter K-pop fans accounts engaged with this hashtag in a coordinated manner to sabotage the conversation by posting mainly K-pop related content accompanied by such hashtags. These hashtags, which include keywords such as vandals and vandalisms, reach the trending topics, but their content include a variety of pictures, gifs, and videos from K-pop music. On May 1st, 2021, Colombian President Ivan Duque, a member of the right-wing Centro Democratico Party, announced military assistance to protect citizens from violence, acts of vandalism, and terrorists during the demonstrations. After the announcement, the debate about militarization spiked on Twitter. While politicians linked to Colombia's Centro Democratico Party promote narratives on social media to frame protests as acts of vandalism and encourage the military assistance to contain the demonstrations, some political leaders from the opposition in Colombia criticized the Colombian authorities for such a measure. Some opposition political leaders have also condemned and reported on social media the police violence against demonstrators, including complaints of human rights violations. Although the DFR lab did not find instances of foreign influence regards conversation on the protests. Our research identified Venezuelan Twitter accounts linked to Maduro's regime, criticizing as well Colombia's government measure on military assistance during the protests. In addition to these narratives, misinformation about Colombia's national strike also spread online and on air after legacy media amplified false and misleading claims amid the ongoing Colombian protests which include inaccurate claims of support to Colombia's government after President Ivan Duque withdrew his tax reform proposal. Other instances of misinformation include recycled videos from protests in other countries, including confrontations between members of the Ecuadorian police and army in Guayaquil, suggesting those belong to, do, to both Colombian National Police and Colombia's army. During the recent Colombian protests, thousands of people have mobilized in different cities across the country, both on social media and on the streets. Colombians have demonstrated against police violence, leading to an ongoing series of manifestations since April 28, including peaceful protests, public unrest, and a widespread violence 
in which Cali has been one of the most affected regions with fatal casualties amid the protests. 